Hi, welcome back, and we're going to talk about uh, helicopter rotor blades and governors uh, now. And uh, I probably ought to preface this by saying the uh, the rotor is not tech, or the yeah the rotor blade is technically not part of an, a, a power plant system. It's it's more an air airframe system. Um, they actually have their own logbook when they go out into the world, but uh, uh, as do propellers, by the way. Uh, but uh, but I want to talk about them uh, in part because they have some of the same stresses on them and some similarities to a propeller, um, and in part because I um, need to talk about those before we get to the uh, helicopter governors. So, uh, rotor blades can be semi-monocoque or monocoque comp uh, composite. Uh, so what monocoque means is strength from the skin, and so they get some or all of their strength from the skin is what what that means. Some of their strength with some sort of internal spar would be semi-monocoque. All of their strength from the skin would be monocoque. Um, composite simply means that we're building it up with um, layers of some sort of fabric with with a resin of some sort that uh, that that holds it in shape. They have to be able to withstand tremendous uh, bending and twisting forces. Um, uh, helicopter blades bend and twist a lot in flight. It's They're flopping around like crazy out there. Um, because of that, um, they are very vulnerable to cracking. Uh, and, uh, and also, they are only strong in flight conditions. The centrifugal force is what holds them out straight. And if you don't have enough of that, um, they can they can fold up on you so that's that's called a low rotor RPM uh, accident and and those do happen there's no such thing as being good enough to recover from that so you got to keep them spinning um, and and the damage tolerance um, can be pretty small you know we look for nicks and and dents on on propellers uh, but the the tolerances for damage on a rotor blade is typically even less. Now there's it does vary from one model to another. The Huey, the the, the Bell 204, 205 series um, is famous or infamous for being able to sustain a lot of damage and still keep going. Um, on the other hand, uh, the the MD 500s um, have a much lower, just a couple thousandths of an inch is the tolerance for a a ding or a, a dent in the leading edge of one of those. So uh, I, it's very important to know the tolerance for your particular helicopter if you're going to fly those things. Here's a cutaway of a of a main rotor blade um, and you can see it's got a foam core, f a glass fiber skin, um, a roving uh, spar. It's In other words, this is a composite um, uh, type of of blade, and uh, and they're they're designed uh, to be able to to go a little bit of distance after they start to fail, um, but uh, which makes the inspection of these really hypercritical. It's very important that they get a good thorough uh, inspection every hundred hours. Here's an example of an R22 blade where the time life was exceeded. We, we typically have an hour limit on uh, rotor blades, a, a, number, a total number of hours past which you, can, you cannot even fly, even if it looks like it's still a perfectly good blade. I think the number is 2,200 hours or something like that for an R22. And this operator flew past that, and look what happened. Um, never a good day when a rotor blade comes off. Um, as you look inside, we can see that there is an area of the inside of the blade that's been sort of polished. Um, and what that indicates is that this crack was progressing for some time before it finally failed. And the, the, the sides of the crack were polishing one another smooth. And then the part that's just gray, uh, that, that's where it finally snapped all at once. Here's another way that uh, built-up composite uh, uh, blades can fail when the skin peels off. The, these things are glued together, bonded together, and uh, there were a few R22 blades that um, that had some voids in the bond, and and th and they had problems with them. And I think most most of that batch have by now been 
long worked out of the uh, uh, fleet but uh, uh, but it's really important again that these be inspected on a regular basis by a competent mechanic that knows what they're looking for here's an example of a really modern blade um, some of the new blades like this one uh, has a little piezoelectric aileron on it um, that moves the blade up and down in order to move the blade out of the turbulent vortex from the preceding blade and that quiets the blade down significantly this is uh, uh, something they've been working really hard on is to make helicopters more quiet um, there's a number of factors that can go into blade fatigue uh, one is to, to just staying within the factory designed uh, time limit uh, one is another is to avoid overspeeds. Overspeeds uh, impart a lot more centrifugal force on the blade, and and so you want to avoid that. High G maneuvering, or for that matter, low G maneuvering, um, that should be avoided. Um, really, that's not what helicopters are good at anyway. They're very good at maneuvering, but there's no reason to be uh, out there doing aerobatics or anything in them. Um, there's environmental f factors, dust, salt, air, and all that. That that can erode the leading edge of the blade. Uh, foreign object damage is a real problem. Uh, everybody ought to be looking around. If they're on a ramp where helicopters operate, always good to keep an eye out for things. Um, it can be any anything up to and including a uh, plastic shopping bag um, can be a real problem. Uh, Keeping the blades tracked and balanced um, and properly rigged will actually make them go to their life limit uh, more reliably. Um, and then, of course, if you run them any into anything, they're, they're obviously going to be damaged. Um, uh, this is most common on tail rotor blades, uh, but, uh, but, even, but the main rotors, too, can be damaged from this. And then, of course, quality control during manufacture is, is really important. Um, helicopter blade pitch is controlled with something called a swash plate and it controls the pitch of the main rotor blades. Um, the swash plate can be raised and lowered to, de to increase or decrease the pitch and so uh, we, the pilot does that with the collective control which is the stick that's beside the seat. You reach down with your left hand and you pull up on that and it increases the pitch on the blades at every point in their rotation. Um, the blades pitch can also be adjusted by moving the cyclic control, which is the one that the pilot uses the right hand to control, um, back and forth and forward and aft to tilt the, the uh, swash plate and then for change the pitch differently depending on where the blade is and its rotation and that in turn tilts the whole rotor disc so that they can direct the lift in the direction they want to go. The one we're really primarily concerned with today for our power plant discussion um, is, is the uh, collective control where we're pulling up uh, to increase the pitch all the way around the circle. And so this is an R22 uh, rotor uh, head and uh, uh, the swash plate is down here at the bottom. The swash plate is connected to the blade pitch horns by the uh, pitch link and uh, and so as the swash plate is raised and lowered it twists the blade out there on the hub. Here's a pic close-up picture of the swash plate all the way at the bottom on the left and then with the collective raised on the right and you can see how the the whole plates moved up and since the pitch change links right on top of that swash plate um, they've now twisted the blade to a, uh, a higher pitch angle now when we do that um, that increases the drag on the rotor system and it requires more torque to overcome that drag. Uh, there is a certain amount of compensation that's built into the throttle mechanism. As we raise the collective, um, there's a set of linkages that connect to the carburetor so that more throttle is automatically applied as we raise the collective. That set of linkages is called the correlator.
but the correlator doesn't quite do the job all by itself. It gets it close, but it's not really close enough. Um, and in the beginning with the R22, the, the rest, the fine tuning was done by the pilot. They would just twist the twist grip to make any small uh, corrections to the RPM manually. Uh, but the R22 had a lot of low RPM accidents, and in an effort to, to, to stem the flow of those, uh, Robinson came up with a governor, and the governor uh, takes care of that business for the pilot, and uh, it does it in a completely different way than the, the airplane constant speed governor that we talked about last time. So um, this system starts with the magnetos. The, uh, the engine uh, speed is proportional to the rotor speed. And so by sensing a, 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 the, the frequency at which a special set of points is opening and shutting within one of the magnetos, uh, we can determine the RPM of the main rotor. We take that frequency signal and we put it into the governor integrated circuit. So there's a little computer built into the, um, the governor system of the R22. And it senses these things. If the, if the RPM is above 80% and the switch is on, then it starts working. If the RPM is outside uh, an acceptable range, which uh, is 524 to 4, 539 RPM, um, then it swings into action. Um, it will also swing into action if the RPM is within the range but moving towards the limit. Um, and uh, it also senses if it's outside the range, it, it takes into account what direction it's moving and how fast. And so if, for instance, it is um, above the range but the RPM is decreasing, then it may not take any action. Um, but if it's above the range and increasing, then it will it'll go ahead and make an input. Um, so it it does all that thinking really 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 fast, and it sends a signal based on that to a little direct current motor, and that direct current motor. Um, is a, it's a step motor, so it can turn in tiny little increments. Uh, and it is directly hooked to the twist grip on the collective, um, which in turn is hooked to the carburetor. Uh, and so it is directly controlling the throttle, essentially, um, uh, which then in turn controls the manifold pressure. Uh, and so what we have here uh, is that is the R22 governor controls the RPM by changing manifold pressure, not by changing pitch, which is why it's totally different than the airplane governor. The airplane governor controlled RPM by changing the load on the engine by changing the pitch of the blades. Most airplane governors that I've seen on propellers are controlled that way. Most helicopter, all the helicopter ones that I've seen, control torque, not load. So, so they, they control the torque that the engine is producing. So it, it, by, by varying the, carb, the throttle setting in the carburetor, we're varying the amount of torque that the engine is producing. That happens automatically. The pilot can actually feel the throttle turning in their hands as as the governor makes little inputs um, if they're paying attention. Um, it is really important, in my opinion, that the pilot be aware of the fact that it's the twist grip on the collective that controls torque and power, not raising and lowering the collective. Yes, they are linked together, but when you raise and lower the collective, you are adjusting blade pitch. It happens to be correlated to the, to the carburetor and further governed by the governor, uh, but, but you're really just adjusting blade pitch. The power, is, uh, the power adjustment happens by changing the torque, by changing the manifold pressure. And that happens with the throttle.
So that's it. Um, it was a short one this time, so we'll uh, we'll see you next time for fuel systems.